The divisional round of playoffs is over, and now NFL Championship Sunday is set. It will be 49ers, Eagles. It will be Chiefs and Bengals. But how did we get here, Matt and I, to break it all down on today's Peacock and Williamson? NFL analyst Brian Peacock and former NFL scout Matt Williamson bring you expert NFL analysis every day in less than 30 minutes. Get an inside look into the NFL on the field and in the front office. With elite breakdowns, next level analysis, and in depth information only for the real NFL fans. This is Peacock and Williamson, and it starts now. Welcome to the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. Brian Peacock alongside Matt Williamson at BD Peacock at Williamson NFL. Of course, we will dip into the P&W mailbag this week. Just hit us at those Twitter handles at BD Peacock at Williamson NFL or drop a comment on the YouTube channel as well. Make sure you are subscribed up to the Locked On NFL YouTube channel. That is the home of Peacock and Williamson there. Thanks, everybody, for making us your first listen here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Peacock and Williamson is presented by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Pick two to five players. If they score more or less than their Prize Picks projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on your entry. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code Locked On. That's prizepicks.com, promo code Locked On. Bengals Bills. Let's start there, Matt. We're not going to do it chronologic. We're going to go with the, uh, I think, the, the games that told the, the biggest story in that order. And I got to go with Bengals and Bills. And somewhat of a surprising, I think, a surprising score. Not that the Bengals, because look, these are two good teams. And I don't sure. think anybody should be shocked by any team winning here. Although, you know, Giants and Jaguars would have been bigger upsets than the others. But the Cincinnati Bengals sort of as, as much underdogs as they were coming into this, that didn't feel right to me. And I think one thing that was hugely exposed here of the Buffalo bills with it for the Bengals over the Buffalo bills is uh, just how incomplete the bills team is and how much more complete the Bengals team is. And there's a reason they've gotten back to back in or AFC championship games now. Yeah, with all respect to the Giants and Jags, I wanted to start with the Sunday games because I, I really do believe that when we woke up Sunday morning, the six best teams in football were still alive, which is wonderful. And frankly, I think the four best teams in football are still alive, which is wonderful. So, yes, I think that was glaring. And not to lump these games together because since he beat the dirt out of Buffalo, more so than your Niners did Dallas. But I thought the Cowboys and Bills – were at least a playmaker short, especially after Pollard went out. And I've been worried about that with the Bills all along, that it's Diggs and the Pips, you know, and they're just asking for Allen to be Superman time and time again. And there's a lot of variance with his game. And when that dips, it, it's a real struggle. But since he beat the crap out of them, I mean, both lines of scrimmage, I mean, like everyone else, my big concern for since he coming in this game was you got three backup offensive linemen, you know, I don't know if you can run the ball particularly well. Were they dominated up front? And Mixon was a huge part of the offense. Yards after contact, yards before contact, you know, time of possession, very few penalties by the Bengals, very clean game. And you're right. I mean, really well coached, um, solid rosters, very few holes, complete team where the Bills are a lot more shoddy. You know, I, I didn't realize, I tweeted this out before the game just how bad Buffalo's pass rush has been since Von Miller's injury. And they've drafted like crazy up front. And those guys aren't bad players. He had Olivers and Rousseau's, but they're not home runs. And then a lot of safety injuries, secondary problems. I mean, their running backs had 11 carries in this game. I mean, three points in the second half. I mean, this was not the juggernaut bills that everyone kind of envisioned. It was really the, the exact thing we laid out in that, if the Bills don't win this game, it's because of blank, and that's exactly how this game played out. But, but even more so than I thought, I, I didn't think it would be a you know a three a three score victory by the Bengals. Right, right. But man, it was clear from the start the Bengals running down the field, and Buffalo was struggling. And um, credit to you know the entire coaching staff of the Bengals, you know it, it, I, the way they were able with the banged up offensive line to handle the Bills defensive line, and you touched on some right, of it because yeah. the Bills have, and I've I've applauded the Bills process of 
trying to build a really good defensive line, it's just been unsuccessful. So I don't know if you mm-hmm. you point to you know, you know part of the process or was it just bad luck? They're not looking at the right type of players. And you look at the games that um, that Von Miller played versus the games that Von Miller didn't play. It was a completely different football team. And, yeah, and I, and I have a feeling, you know, um, we might have seen the same thing from the Los Angeles Rams last year because Von Miller really turned it on in the playoffs. He's one of those players, with, you know, the, the stars come out. And I think we saw a little bit of that this weekend where the stars really shine and, and they uh, a, a superstar player in the NFL can really elevate when the bright lights are on. And I think the Buffalo Bills just lacked that. Yeah, yeah, without question. And we'll probably talk more this week of – what the off season entails for some of these eliminated teams. Hopefully we can get to that and all that. But the, it, as you were saying that about the bills D line, cause I'm the same way. When in doubt, give me another defensive lineman in the draft. You never could have too many roll them out there like Bama and Georgia does. But those linemen that they drafted are also more built to play with a lead. You know, there's a little bit of hubris there. We're going to be, we're going to be the team winning 27, 10, and we can have all these lighter guys attacking up field and NASCAR packages. You know, who's the, the bang, where's the DJ reader? You know what I mean? Like that, where since he's got a big physical defensive front, they're getting after Josh Allen with a three man rush. You know, they're blitz packages or pseudo blitz packages. You know, they'd bring a defensive back and drop somebody, they're coming free. You know, so they were putting a lot of stress on the Bills' protection. Buffalo barely even tried to run the ball. And again, it's just like, Hey, Josh, go make a play for us. And when he doesn't, which is hard to do, and all these things get elevated, of course, come playoff time, all your deficiencies become so much more glaring. I mean, that's what's amazing about playoff games to me is the fact that Burrow, even I, I kind of laughed a little making fun of the Bengals, but I mean, coming into this game, Burrow had more wins than any Bengals quarterback before this game. I mean, at four, now he's got five. You know, I mean, yeah. it, it's just so hard to win a playoff game the Bills are a great team. And all we're talking about is, boy, their O-line wasn't very good. They don't have enough weapons. Their D-line got pushed around. You know, they win nine out of ten games against the rest of the league. But in this time of year, your deficiencies really show up. And we'll talk about that in every, all one of the, all these games. And when you get really good coaches and, and really good teams on the other side, they can scheme against your weaknesses. Absolutely. And, 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 and so that's where it gets difficult for uh, a team like the Buffalo Bills. You just got so one-dimensional, whether it was the run game, whether it was uh, each line not winning often enough. And so credit to uh, – and to be honest with you, offhand, I think I heard the name yesterday and I forgot already – uh, whoever the offensive line coach is for the Cincinnati Bengals. I mean, get- I think it's Callahan who's very, very well. Oh, it's, 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 it's yeah. Callahan. Okay, no yeah. one. Well, there you go. Because, yeah. Uh, he I'm glad it. you mentioned him because I wanted to. I mean, he had a whole week with that five. You know, like the, it's really hard when you lose a starter in game because you didn't prep all week for him. I'm sure yes. Callahan coached the heck out of those guys, you know, this week preparing for the Bills specifically. And boy, it showed up. And they were physical, you know, moving people in the run game. It d- didn't even, uh, and by the way, Joe Mixon, 20 for 105 and a touchdown there. Yeah. Um, that, but uh, Joe Burrow was kept pretty clean too. Like, I, yeah, it was the one thing you said, okay, this is why the Bengals won't advance if they lose this game. And it was not even remotely a problem. That, that kind of nope. blows me away. And so you got to point to the Bills not doing enough with their defensive front um, and, and really letting them down, I think, in a way. And of course, big credit to the coaching staff of the Cincinnati Bengals. Real quick, I think sacks are 50% uh, quarterback stat, 50% a blocking stat. Because, like, Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, they never get sacked. It doesn't matter who's blocking for them. I mean, they may get the ball out super quick. But Burrow has really elevated that part of his game as well. I mean, it's getting the ball out, processing, where the blitz is coming from, when to hold it, when to not. Where when he was young, he's just like, hit me, I don't care. I'm going to drive it down the right. field to chase, you know. It wasn't this just this game either. It, no, it's been, it's all, been season all year. That, right. that getting the ball out a lot sooner, taking a lot less hits. And how about just the the efficiency of spreading the ball around? Jamar Chase, eight catches yeah. or uh, eight targets, five catches for sixty one and a touchdown. Hurst had five catches for fifty nine and a touchdown. P Ryan had five catches out of the backfield. T Higgins had you know it's, he's always got. It seems like every time he catches the ball, it's a big either touchdown or a big first down conversion. He had three catches. Uh, Tyler Boyd to catch. Mixing a couple out of the backfield, Irwin, Wilcox, they're just really spreading the ball around. Nobody had 100 yards receiving, but at the end of the day, it was a really good line for Joe Burrow, 242 yards passing, a couple of touchdowns. They ran the ball a lot, just really efficient, kind of balanced offense for the Cincinnati Bengals. And, and I felt like if they had to, they could have thrown all over them in the fourth quarter. They just didn't have to. You know, Burrow could have ended up with 342 yes. instead of 242. 
So we have the Cincinnati Bengals advancing 27 to 10 over the Buffalo Bills. They will play the Kansas City Chiefs in the AFC Championship game. More about how the Chiefs advanced, which was you know quite a start, I think, to the weekend. And, and props to those Jaguars. Next, we'll talk Cowboys 49ers, and we will talk Giants Eagles. Today's episode of Peacock and Williamson is presented by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy played easy you might ask how easy could daily fantasy be well let me uh break it down for you because you can make an entry in as much time as it takes me to talk about this prize picks ad read right 60 seconds or less boom you are done you could just pick two players you say i like that projection i think uh patrick mahomes championship weekend going way over in yards so you say i'm gonna go more than the yards projection at prize picks and you pick another player and that's it that's all you got to do you can pick two to five players if they score more or less than their prize picks projection you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry you're not competing with other people it's just you versus projections available again only two to five players and this is every single day you don't have to go uh pick an entire roster uh and and, and spend all week thinking about it you just go pick a couple players prize picks Boom, boom, against the projections every single day. Not just NFL either. You don't have to wait till Sunday. NBA, PGA Golf, uh, Major League Baseball, when that gets going very soon. Man, it's almost springtime. Spring training's going to get going here in February. Uh, NHL, hockey, college hoops, women's hoops, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing, even things like Euro basketball and disc golf and cricket and tons more projections you can find at Price Picks. Download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com. Sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, Prize Picks will give you $50 more to play with. Don't forget to enter promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. Thanks again, everybody, for making Peacock and Williamson your first listen every day. Make sure you're subscribed up to the Locked On NFL YouTube channel. That is the home on YouTube of Peacock and Williamson. And, of course, you can find Peacock and Williamson on all of your other podcast platforms. You can also find on the Locked On NFL channel on YouTube. The biggest NFL stories like NFL Key Predictions podcast every Friday and Monday. Local insiders cover the weekend with game-to-game -game episodes. Peacock and Williamson, Locked On NFL, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget, your team is covered every single day right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. 49ers-Cowboys, Matt. This was uh, a battle of two pretty good defenses. And, and this is a game that I think some people thought, ah, oh, this is this is not a fun game. It's 9-6 to six and at halftime, right? Uh, but for people who enjoy, I think, close games and people who mm -hmm. enjoy good defense this was more good defense than bad offense agree to me. Yeah. And, and i think the biggest takeaway i had from this game it was it was the team that turned it over less which happened to be the rookie quarterback that beat the veteran quarterback who threw too many interceptions yeah i, I think that's huge obviously is um we're, everyone's going to focus on the quarterbacks for better or worse I, i've heard things this morning like man is Dak prescott worth that contract i don't know i'm like I a saw lot of one like was, that Prescott, you know. It's funny because Cowboys fans were and, and look and, and I, I cover the 49ers, so and, and Cowboys 49ers is a big rivalry. Sure. Uh, it's really cool to see them in the playoffs again and back to back years now. And you know, there's a lot of fighting, and I see so much of that, and I don't get involved, but I see so much of it with 49ers fans and Cowboys fans fighting about it. And I always say, I always think, why don't you wait? The game is gonna be in two days. Why are you trying to litigate who's the better team and who's gonna win when the actual game is gonna happen in two days, right? You know, it's like, yeah. you can argue about you know. The 95 Cowboys against the the 2022 49ers or something because they can't play each other. But this game's going to happen. So why are you guys fighting about who's going to win the game and trying to convince the other person that your team's going to win? It's going to happen in two days. But um, And then po so what happens is fans get really excited. Our team's going to win. Our team's going to beat you. Our team's going to go win to the Super Bowl. This is it. Dak Prescott is the guy. This is his career-defining game. And then when they don't win, right? then it comes back to, oh, now he's not the guy. Oh no, we're doomed, and we have we're we're the Minnesota Vikings now because we have a middle. <laughs> we'll never win again. Yeah, and so that that was one of the funniest ones I saw when they compared Dak and and the Cowboys now to the Minnesota Vikings, where they're always going to be good, but they're never going to be good enough to win because their quarterback is just going to be kind of middle of the road. And yeah. I I will say, and I, I think that's you know probably just waking up morning after not feeling great about a big loss for your team. Because I heard that from Cowboys fans. This isn't from the outside, because I think a lot of people on the outside still really like Dak Prescott. But it was a big moment for Dak Prescott. And in a career-defining moment for him, a potential let's go 
beat this 49ers team rival game, go to the NFC championship game. And there were some really ugly drives at the end of the game. There were some big interceptions early that can't happen. And it is fair to say that Dak Prescott's inconsistency is probably difficult for Cowboys fans to live with right now, even though he's a really good player. Yeah. And 25 teams would kill for him, you know, so (laughs) it's not such a bad problem. Um, I I do think it's very interesting because everyone's going to, you know, talk about these quarterbacks, of course. And, the two interceptions were both bad. I mean, they, they were not good plays by him. They were not good reads and he didn't have a good game, but you, you, you kind of preface this game by talking about really good defense. And that's what I saw here too. I mean, the length and speed of your Niner defense was just so apparent. And I read this morning, they played like 95% zone and they just cover so much ground with their length and speed. I mean, there's no fat guys on the field. There's no, run, you know, stopping neck roll linebackers. I mean, the the strong safety is one of the fastest guys on the field. You know I mean? It's just a lot of, there's no, they just constrict everything so well. And to Purdy's credit, I'm, I'm not saying I deserve, he deserves an apology from me for questioning him. I'm still questioning him, but he didn't lose it for him. And in this, this instance, in this style of game, that is absolutely tremendous. And you're right. And the fourth quarter belonged to the Niners and I don't think they started to figure things out as much as they were just winning the time of possession battle, getting a couple more plays. And as I mentioned with the bills, it was more apparent to me with Dallas that they were a weapon short. Like if you give them Ayuk, they got a different game. You know what I mean? Like that's the beauty of really the Bengals. You laid that out yesterday, but especially the Niners is even if a guy like Pollard gets hurt, You can overcome it. You know what I mean? Like this might be a lesson when in doubt, give me another weapon too, you know, because as soon as Pollard went out, I was like, well, where's the juice There's CD lamb. And then a bunch of guys that don't run that well. Uh, No doubt. And yeah, once Pollard was out of the game, that was really difficult. And and Pollard wasn't doing amazing things, but you could tell he has a little bit of juice there. Yeah. He's something. Yeah. Yeah. You know, CD, CD lambs, 10 catches for 117 yards. Great. And that was it. You know, yeah, right. Schultz, nobody else did anything. Alton Schultz in that early drive um, had the touchdown in the first quarter. And and, and that was and about he, it from him. And a couple and he caught like four play. balls on the last drive against no coverage. You know? Right. And, right. and kind of bonehead, a couple of bonehead plays back to back, one nonchalantly going out of bounds. And you could have had maybe a. Did you know that rule, by the way? The, the, the retreat, dumbest rule I've ever heard. Yeah. You have to go out of, you have to go out of bounds with vigor. Yeah. That, just, that's, that's a weird one. And apparently Charvarius Ward knew it. Cause he was pointing at him, like run the yeah. clock and I, I, you go out of bounds, you go out of bounds. I don't know. That, that was a sort of a rule that was, that's, I don't know when that was implemented, but um, I don't know who thought that needed to be implemented. You know what? People aren't going out of bounds hard enough. We got to go switch that. Yeah. <laughs> and I never got the memo on it. That's a, maybe. So players don't get hit. It's gotta be a safety thing. Maybe. Maybe going out of yeah, bounds, but maybe you, it's kind of like the Kenny getting, Pickett you, face slide or the Lamar Jackson the, stop, and then everybody lets him go, and then he takes right. off. You know, so I it's don't like know. you don't get the clock and give yourself up. So it's one or the other. We you don't have time for that conversation. Running, right? or uh, you have away, to man. really try to get out of bounds. So I guess yeah, in yeah. that regard, it makes sense. Um, but then the next play is unforgivable, where he just stepped out of bounds. There's nobody around him, and, right. and so you have to run whatever that play was at the end of the game, which the 49ers just completely wrecked. Uh, I would have loved to see what they With were Zeke planning the on doing yeah. there, but seeing uh, Zeke Elliott snap the ball and just almost get knocked completely back into the quarterback. <laughs> it's like me or and, you trying to block him, right? And like, the moment never... Cavante, and I like the idea of, okay, get the ball to your kick returner who almost broke a couple in that game, but as the moment he catches the ball, Jimmy Ward just crushes him, and that's the end of the game. He's like, such an <laughs> anti active play. It's like, oh, this looks fun. What's it going to be? It's like, okay, this is the worst play ever. Yeah, I wonder how much time in practice this year they spent on that. Probably, but anyway, you know what? And maybe they tried to get Cavante Turpin the ball. I mean, he was a scary guy. Yeah. I mean, if if that's what we're talking about, you know, how about a, a tunnel screen to Turpin at some point during the game? That was the only catch of the game was that last play for Cavante Turpin, and and he's dynamic with the ball in his hands. But mm-hmm. yes, yeah, CD Lamb ten catches for one hundred seventeen, and the 49ers are like, sure, you can throw it to CD Lamb and find some holes in the zone, and we'll come up and tackle him. And if mm-hmm. that's all you got, we're going to win this football game. You're going to score twelve points, and that's what happened. Right, it's kind of empty calories, you know. Uh, the speed of the Cowboys defense, though, was different for the 49ers. And the 49ers oh, yeah. played the easiest schedule in the NFL this year. And they I know they've been undefeated for you know, 12, 13 games now. And they ran the table at the end of the year. And they're putting 30 points up on everybody with the rookie seventh-round quarterback. 
But this was a big test for Brock Purdy and the 49ers to face a, a legitimate defense with, with just a lot of speed on it, especially up front that was pressuring Brock Purdy and really thwarting a lot of the outside zone stuff and doing a good job of running around and and limiting the 49ers catch and run playmakers on the stuff that's close to the line of scrimmage. So a uh, fantastic job by the Cowboys defense and credit to Brock Purdy, who didn't throw the ball to the other team yeah. and took what was there and didn't try to force too much. And even when he got out of the pocket and looked a little frantic, he still threw the ball away. Didn't throw the ball to the other team. He, had, he took a couple sacks, but nothing egregious. And the 49ers in the end, they were able to impose their will on a tired Dallas Cowboys defense in the fourth quarter. That's what I thought too. It was in the fourth quarter, they just been out there a little too much and you know, it was a little too much of a test, too many good guys to cover. And that was the difference. And that's, you know, that's how the playoffs goes. It was an excellent game. And by the way, we're going to talk about the teams that are now out of it and, and what's next for them on tomorrow's episode. Mm -hmm. So we'll be talking about the bills and the Cowboys. And we've talked a little bit about some of the holes and, and how to fix those teams. And, and I have a feeling we're going to see a lot of those teams back here next year but uh, i do think we have the four best teams here in championship sunday and we're going to get to the other two here uh with the giants and eagles next along with chiefs jaguars and a uh, nice little run by those jacksonville jaguars that did end saturday but first some big news here on the network we're really excited about our New sports betting partner for Locked On because they are the number one sports book in America to go along with the number one podcast sports network in America, right? FanDuel. If you're new to FanDuel, that's even better because they have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. New FanDuel customers join today and get started with $150 in free bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Yeah, $150 in free bets when you place your first $5 bet. Just sign up at FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel has all of your favorite bets from the money line to point spreads to player props. You can build your own uh, same game parlays if you want to. Tons of fun ways to bet on sports at FanDuel. Such a clean uh, uh, such a clean platform too. Uh, I love the way their website looks. It's really easy to navigate, really easy to find exactly the bets you are looking for and build those bets and all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. So football fans don't miss out. Place your first $5 bet and get $150 in free bets, win or lose at fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sports book partner of the NFL, and now the Locked On Podcast Network. How about those Jaguars? They nearly did it, Matt. This was a pretty cool game on Saturday because uh, I got to be honest, I had to go back and, and really find out what happened in this game because I was on the slopes in Lake Yeah, Tom, how about that? Little skiing. It was uh, very needed in my life to get away and be able to do that. Unfortunately, there's games on a Saturday, so I was actually on a lift on my phone watching the beginning of the game, I saw that first Travis Kelsey touchdown. I saw the Chiefs go down there too easily, and I turned it off, and I thought, this is going to be a route. I'm going to go check in with some hot cocoa a little bit later. And when I did check in with some hot cocoa a little bit later, it was not a blowout. And in fact, there was a different quarterback in for the Kansas City Chiefs, and I was blown away at what that was. So um, I had to hang out in the lodge and find out what was going on and, and ended up going back and watching a lot of that game. And uh, Patrick Mahomes, Banged up. Looks like he's going to be okay here, which is a big story, but maybe not 100% going into Championship Sunday, which kind he of can't be 100% against the Bengals because that looked bad. And I was actually a little bit surprised when I saw the slow motion tackle that Patrick Mahomes was even back in the football game there. But he made it back in the football game, and the Kansas City Chiefs, Chiefs did survive and advance over the pesky Jacksonville Jaguars. What a run for the Jags this year. Yeah, I was on a ski lift, but uh, the you know that first <laughs> pre-injury – it looked like, wow, Mahomes is as good as he's ever been, which is as big a statement as you can say in this whole game's history. And post-injury, he was still pretty effective. I mean, he, he wasn't mobile. He had a hard time handing off. I mean, you could tell that he couldn't do the trick shots as much, but he still moved the football pretty well. And congrats to Chad Henney. Come down, hold down the fort for seven throws. He's one of the very few players in the league that I actually watched as a high school player in my pit days, which means I'm really old and he's really old is all that yeah. means because <laughs> there's really very few left. Yeah. yeah. And not only did he come, 
he he had a better quarterback rating than Patrick Mahomes did. Uh, he drove down the field on a touchdown yeah. drive, five of seven, and a score. Uh, pretty amazing there by Chad Henney, who's tr- who tried to retire years ago, and Andy Reid wouldn't let him. I always find that an interesting dynamic, and we can talk about that stuff later. But you know, my, even my son's like, why would they pay Henny that many million a year just to not play ever? I'm like, well, he has value as that guy between Mahomes and Reed. That's it. It's working. Don't mess with it. Yeah. Um, Lawrence was fine. The Jags played well. To open the show, I said I wanted to talk more Sunday than Saturday. But I think lumping the Jags and Giants is a little unfair to the Jags. They were much more competitive in this game than New York was against Philly, clearly. And I think they have more answers on their roster than the Giants do now. And that's more of an offseason conversation. But how do we not mention Travis Kelsey? I mean, he caught 14 balls, only 98 yards, but he was open anytime they wanted. I, 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 and I don't know what the answer is because you have Patrick Mahomes throwing the ball, or even if it's Chad Henney, uh, and, and if you're just double, triple covering or whatever with Travis Kelsey, someone else is going to be open. You're probably still not going to win the game. But mm-hmm. at some point, when do you not do something drastic to try to limit a guy who you know the other team is trying to get the ball to as much as possible and who's just so effective? Like, you've got to be able to bracket him somehow, right? Especially on those third down plays and in the red zone because you know where the ball's going. It, it, there's a stand up from like 20 years ago about Wilt Chamberlain's 100 point game, you know, and at halftime, Wilt has 60. So, what's the coach? So, guys, uh, who, who's got Wilt? <laughs> you know, like after a while, right. it's like you kind of know where the ball's going and what's the problem here. And doubling tight ends is a lot harder than people think. It's, you know, if, if there's an outside receiver, you can just bracket them. Reed moves to Kelsey around. He knows you're trying to doubt, double him. It's much easier when we sit on our lazy boy. Why don't you put five guys on Kelsey? But it is amazing that he can get open at will. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. 14 catches for 98 yards, uh, two touchdowns. And it's not like he was gouging them deep down the field either. It's just like they're so good. It's like right. I know where the soft – space in the zone is and my quarterback does and i'm gonna get open and you're gonna throw me the ball it's it's really backyard pitch and catch like um you know big brother and little brother can't stop him yeah and kind of opened the show talking about firepower and cowboys being a guy short the bills being a guy short i didn't think i'd ever say on january 23rd the chiefs have the least firepower left in the in the playoffs but they do and a, a less than 100% Patrick Mahomes right. really start to show that. And that's where you start to see, that's okay, the it might start to get uh, a little bit worrisome there. Um, although he doesn't have to be super athletic and throw the ball very far if it's just, you know, seven-yard shots too. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, here, how about this for another basketball reference? If it's uh, Stockton to Malone pick and roll, which you just can't – you can't. Yeah, you know it's coming. Basically what's happening there. Absolutely. With, uh, with Mahomes and Travis Kelsey. But, man um, – Jags have a bright future, though. We'll talk to them about them later. Yeah, sure. absolutely. Yeah, Great run. Around here, yeah. uh, fantastic. You know, ATN, you can't really, when, when you're trying to come back in the game, can't really run the ball a lot. But ATN's definitely a weapon for that mm-hmm. offense to go with Trevor Lawrence. He had 10 carries for 62 yards. Uh, get him involved in the pass game, I think, a little bit more in, in future seasons. And he'll be a real problem in the NFL next year. Evan Ingram, uh, that that's somebody they're going to have to bring back. He's just so big and fast. And I loved seeing his breakout season with the Jaguars. And, and I think it's nice to have. I mean, all you have to do is look at the other sideline to see how important a tight end is for a, sure. a quarterback and even a veteran quarterback. And Patrick Mahomes, the oldest quarterback that was that, that's left at 27 years old. Um, but for young Trevor Lawrence, having Evan Ingram there uh, is really important. We've seen so, yeah. Throw, throw Ridley in the mix next year, yeah, which is awesome, good. right? Yeah, they'll be fine. Young competitive defense is pretty darn good too. So, mm-hmm. so props to them as well. No doubt. The Gi- the Giants are, had such a weird season. I, I mean, they got blown out. This was this game was not close. This I don't it, think we need to spend a lot of time on the game. The Giants were the worst team, the worst yeah. roster left in in the you know in this tournament in the divisional weekend, and they had such a great run. And Brian Dayball is going to get Coach of the Year votes for very good reason because of that. Thirty eight to seven, the final here. The Philadelphia Eagles clearly the best team on the field. Such a complete football team. I don't even know what to take away from this game except good run by the Giants and the Eagles are the most complete team left in the playoffs. Yeah. Dominant on both lines of scrimmage as they're built. They have a plethora of weapons. Didn't even need them. You know, Smith, Goddard, Brown. Yeah. You know, or it, it, the questions I think surrounding Philly coming into this game was, wow, it's a division opponent. Are they going to be rusty? How healthy is Hurts? Well, I think they answered all those, although they didn't ask a lot of Hurts. And I think they told him 
favor that shoulder any chance he get. But they ran for 268 yards against a bad run defense. And this is probably a later in the week conversation. But I feel a little bad for Daniel Jones because he played so well against a bad Vikes defense last week. And now all I see is, boy, Daniel Jones lost $10 million a year. He stinks. He turned into a pumpkin. I'm like, they didn't block anybody. I mean, he didn't play well, but they didn't really block anybody. And that defensive front that set the sack record is really hard to play against. The Eagles are, are just too good. They're too complete. They're, they're, they're getting really, good quarterback really good. play. They can run the ball. They've got good offense and defensive line. Lane Johnson battling through. Uh, Travis Kel- or, uh, Kelsey. Jason Kelsey just yeah. continues to play such. Good uh, day for the Kelseys. Uh, yeah, great day, actually. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and then you have the weapons on the outside to go with it, with, with Smith and A.J. Brown and the defense and, and the, the work they did in the secondary. Um, their run defense is better than it was for the Philadelphia Eagles, yeah. and they've been healthier on their defensive line as well. So yeah, this is just a, this Kenneth was a Ainwell chips in with 112 rushing yards. You oh, know, yeah. like, well, right. Just, oh, okay, sure. Yeah, Nine point three yards per carry, no big deal. I mean, <laughs> right, no, right, yeah. And, and to be honest with you, I thought Hertz carried the ball more than he needed to. And nine carries for 34. I mean, he could have just stood back but there and handed it off, yeah. and they could have rolled right into the championship game. So, um, but the Giants might be the most. Well, maybe the Ravens, but the Giants might be the most interesting offseason team. And maybe we'll even spend a whole show on them at some point just because what do you do with Jones? What do you do with Barkley? They still have so many roster holes. Nobody expected them to get here. I mean, they uh, they they coached too well almost. And I mean, that is a great compliment because they were playing with house money, but they're not one player away. The Jags might be one player away. The Giants are not. The Daniel Jones stuff, too, is, is very similar to the Dak Prescott situation we talked about earlier. And they played a really great game and, and um, you know, so Long much hype. Ago, we loved them. Now we hate them. And then you play a, a legitimate defense and it's like, oh, yeah, right. now they look worse. Like the other t- you can look at the other side because they get paid, too. And that was a big reason that uh, Dak Prescott struggled more than the week before. He played a lot better defense. And same thing for Daniel Jones here. Yeah. And the Eagles weren't afraid of the, the Giants weapons. And, you know, if, if the. Uh, Isaiah Hodgins are going to beat you, so be it. But we are going to attack the run with great D-line and very talented front. Eagles, 49ers, Chiefs, Bengals, Championship Sunday next week. Of course, we will break down those games in depth here all week long on Peacock and Williamson. And we're going to look back at the Giants and the Bills and the Cowboys and the Jaguars and talk about what's next for those teams who have now been eliminated. And of course, your questions coming up with our mailbag episode this week and some guests around the Locked On Podcast Network as well. All coming up. Thanks, everybody, for making Peacock and Williamson your first listen every day. Check out everything else going on in the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team is covered at BD Peacock at Williamson NFL for your mailbag questions. Matt and I Back tomorrow, right here, Peacock and Williamson.